All right. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing well. Good to be welcome. back, you guys. Good to see you both. Yeah. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Good to have you. Likewise. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there's a lot of uh, developments. We could talk about anything, <laughs> but I think the first thing we should cover is this Ocean Gate submarine implosion. It's the biggest topic right now on mainstream news. And what I think this is, I think this is simply a distraction from the bigger things going on, the juicier stories like the Durham report, the alleged links that are now connecting the dots with the affiliation between Jeffrey Epstein and the big financial institutions, Hunter Biden getting a slap on the wrist. And there are so many other things, you know, Vindel, if you'd like to finish off my thought here. But yeah, so Andy, um, I think we think the submarine, the, the entire, you know, uh, thing that they've been covering on the news, mainstream media was a big distraction. We, we want your opinion on this because during that time of the submarine issue going on, BlackRock has been consolidating. You know, a lot of things have been happening in the background. So the first thing I got a list here. Sam Bankman freed the Fed agrees to drop five charges out of 13. You know, the guy who stole billions of dollars. That's one thing that actually took place. Second thing is the Pentagon accidentally provides two, uh, 6 two $6.2 billion to Ukraine. Another thing that took place is BlackRock and J.P. Morgan Chase help Ukraine set up a reconstruction bank to steer seed capital into rebuilding projects to attract hundreds of billions in private investments. And another thing is U.S. regulators approve the sale of chicken made from animal cells, basically paving the way for two Californian companies to sell lab-grown meat. So all that has happened during the submarine thing, covering, being covered on the media. So what what do you think? What's going on here? The distraction and the misdirection of the public, it, it's very embarrassing when you think about how easily the public is distracted. It becomes very frightening when you realize the agenda that is controlled by uh, an entity that is able to control the narrative on all of the media when you know you have entities like Bloomberg that own so much of the media when you realize that four companies or so own just about every single magazine TV station radio station media outlet that there is and the fact that so many of these things are sliding underneath uh, the the realization or the attention of the public um, because of some sort of, of a distraction. And, you know, you're right. It, it's tragic that five people go missing in what would be a horrible way to die. Uh, but, you know, there are car accidents every day where five people die a horrible death. There are, are people that are missing every day across the, the U.S. in accidents or in in, in mishaps on the ocean or whatever it may be that certainly didn't get this type of attention. Of course, you have, you know, billionaires on, on board and their grandson and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, hyperbole around the Titanic, which has always been something that has, um, you know, people have always flocked to, to stories of the Titanic and, Look, the bottom line is I get what you're saying, and I, I completely and totally agree with it. The media distracts and, and talks about things that are completely non-relevant while ignoring the bigger issue, being ignoring the really important things. There's virtually no attention whatsoever on the mainstream media about what's going on with with Hunter Biden about what is going on with this the the whistleblower claims uh, it's getting no attention whatsoever it's getting uh, and then the attention that you see is um, you know very very slanted in fact to me it's emblematic of a very frightening trend and that is there is no journalistic integrity whatsoever anymore we get the news from people like yourself and other YouTube uh, YouTubers and alternative media outlets that are telling the truth. But what becomes very concerning and very frightening is that the this this narrative that is continuing to the mainstream, to the public, to the 
to the masses out there who who aren't really they're asleep and they're following the wrong things and even people who consider themselves to be very well read they're reading the wrong things and it's you know this is all intentional so yeah to your point i find it to be as concerning as anything happening out there because you know, it makes makes all of us who talk about things that we see very clearly based upon a criteria maybe of logic and mathematics and economics and things that that allow us to get to our conclusions in a legitimate, orderly, uh, well thought out fashion. And it, it casts a disparaging light upon us as being conspiratorialists. But I will tell you this, there has never been a finer line between conspiracy and reality and the fact that the media does what they do to to distract us from what's really important instead of talking mm -hmm. about this tragedy. Um, not only is it gross to me, it, it's frightening and speaks of a much bigger issue altogether when you realize just exactly what it is that they're trying to do by not sharing this very, very, very important information i mean the, the realization that you know the fbi was holding on to hunter's laptop for months before the election um and these these uh claims by the whistleblower were made months before the 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 2020 election um it's it's dumbfounding and it would have changed everything and the 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 fact that we are being misled by our media is a very frightening thought because it's not the media that's doing that. The media is being controlled by someone above. And mm -hmm. that to me is what is frightening. It's not the fact that we're being distracted. It's why. And the why to me becomes something that I don't know, I find to be as scary as anything that, uh, that I've ever talked about on YouTube in, in three years of doing these, these podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I agree with you, but uh, the distractions, um, yeah, it's kind of crazy because so much has been happening while they were covering this whole submarine issue, like the list I just shared with you, just unbelievable. Oh. And then you mentioned the whole thing with the Hunter Biden and the list goes on, to be honest, Andy. But yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with you on that. It is frightening. Oh. Yeah, and simply by focusing their attention on these incidents, the media, they what they do is they overshadow and downplay other critical investigations and crucial events that are unfolding. And like you said, the pattern really does raise concerns about whether there's a deliberate effort to obfuscate and even divert attention from the real evil, I would say, unfolding behind the scenes. And there's no really question but that to be true. And that's what I'm getting at. That is, to me, what is the most concerning part about it all. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, most people don't have a clue what's coming and you can't get out of the way of what you don't see coming. And that to me is, is where it becomes very concerning. Yes. And I think this really leads to the next point then. And when we talk about like big institutions like BlackRock, they are attempting right now to consolidate global markets and they've been doing this for a long time. But this current application for a Bitcoin ETF, it, it really it concerns me because in 2017, they said that Bitcoin was the ideal technology for uh, money laundering. And now all of a sudden, in 2023, they're filing a spot for a Bitcoin ETF. So and in the last six years, nothing has really significantly changed about Bitcoin. And it raises the question, are, are they actually, are we about to witness like a biggest money laundering operation unfold in history? And also, if they're doing this in order to consolidate the ledgers, and that way they can introduce their unified central bank digital currency. And that ties us into what my brother recently discovered. And I think we should pull that up, Vindel, if you don't mind. Can you, uh, is the screen sharing? Yeah, so, there we um, go. so Andy, um, uh, I know you're aware of what's going on with the IMF and CBDCs, the whole narrative they're pushing. But now they're really taking it to the next step and they're making it public. So the IMF, uh, the head of the IMF, Georgia, um, excuse me, Christina. Christina. Georg yep. Yeah, Christina. So what she was saying was that they're working on a universal 
central bank digital currency, obviously, right. to eliminate cash and have more control. Right. Uh, this was recent, you know, but it's interesting because the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, came out with a report titled Trust, Bridges, and Money Flows, a digital marketplace to improve cross-border payments. And it's interesting because on page 23, I think it was, they mm -hmm. actually mentioned XRP and XLM. Here we and go. this is recent. So the three models arise, a private settlement asset and marketplace such as Ripple's XRP, an open source marketplace such as Stellar's Foundation, that's XLM. This is from the IMF. So clearly, XRP and XLM have something to do with this new central bank digital currency or the platform they're working on. There is a direct connection because this report came from the IMF. Yeah, the IMF has been in the news a lot lately. And um, I'll get to that point right there in a second. Christina, Kristalina Georgieva has said a lot of things lately that have, have been very concerning. Um, but I'll get to that point. She said recently that she blamed the problem with the banks on in the U.S. on complacency and that the the ability of savers to move their money online with a single click would require a lot of new regulatory thinking and that it's the speed in which money can move from one place to another that um, is something that that she was concerned about. And, you know, I think that um, uh, she is certainly someone who uh, you should pay attention to. The IMF might be the second most powerful bank in the world and and in reading a little bit about that that report i understand that what she basically said was that it she wants to be able to have a, a common regulatory framework for digital currencies that will allow for a global inoperability or interoperability in other words that each country is supposed to have their own CBDC by 2025. That was according to the, the BIS, which would be one notch above the IMF and in terms of, of where they are in the hierarchy. Um, and so when I read that report and maybe I read it incorrectly, what I took away from it was that she was talking about having these kind of like a gateway for these currencies to talk with one another, or it would be filled by private currencies such as XRP, such as Bitcoin, that if they didn't do this, that you would see a vacuum that would pull in other private cryptos that would fill that void. I don't know that she is a advocate of any of the private ledger currencies such as Bitcoin or XRP or Ripple, any of them, I think she's more of, of a uh, of a government um, lackey who is talking about using CBDCs and one common language for them all to communicate with one another. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. I am not really sure, but I, what I am sure about, look, the, the, the BIS said by 2025, everyone need to have an operational CBDC. And, you know, one of the things that I really took away from what she says was that, that if, if they are not backed by an asset, then they're just speculative investments. In other words, she thinks that they need to be backed by something. And I also think it's interesting that they published a report a few months ago about gold. The IMF had a report mm -hmm. that said gold, a barbarous relic. What did it say? Gold as an international reserve currency, question mark, a barbarous relic no more. Is this why the BIS reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset? Is this why the central banks are buying it? Is she intimating that in order to have legitimacy in, on the world stage, you must have a CBDC pegged to something like gold <clears throat> to give it legitimacy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There are a lot of things that she's been saying lately um, that make me believe we are moving away from the banking system, that we are consolidating to, to in an effort to 
roll out CBDCs and um, and she is an advocate of having them pegged to something. I don't know what role we will see Ripple or XRP, although I see a lot more talk about it lately in, in various circles. Um, I just think that an institution like the IMF and the BIS are going to do all of they can to control, not decentralize, but to actually centralize whatever central bank or digital currency they roll out. I quite frankly think they're more afraid of something like XRP and Ripple and Bitcoin, which allow a more freer, um, uh, an ability to trade in a more free fashion. Um, I think it concerns them. And I think that's why she said that if they don't do something like this, that it opens up the um, the likelihood that that vacuum gets filled by other private ledger or open ledger, I don't even know the correct way to say it, opens yes. it up to things like Ripple, like Bitcoin, like other things that are not centralized and controlled by, by the government. So I guess what I'm simply saying is this, I don't know that she is a fan of XRP and Ripple as much as she understands that if they don't do this, the inevitability of these types of uh, these types of platforms will find their way into the global system. So I don't know if it's pro or con, but I do think she's someone to take very seriously. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, well, hmm. this this is why I was you know raising the concern about BlackRock. I still think the irony is staggering. You know how their shift it just their their ideology just fundamentally changed about bitcoin in such a time and it raises questions again because blackrock's true motivations you know we don't really know what they are but if you look at their track record they've weaponized so many industries before right and you you, you cannot help but wonder if this is some sort of calculated attempt to launder money or manipulate the markets because that's what they've been doing that's what the hinman documents revealed i don't know if you're familiar with that but the way I see it is that if BlackRock can weaponize the crypto industry by getting a Bitcoin ETF out there and BlackRock being the center of all of this, they have their hands in everything. What is essentially an ETF? You're going to get investors that don't have the best understanding about how this is unfolding because they're not looking at the documents from the IMF. They're not looking at the documents we've been discussing here. They're just going to put their money where everyone else is putting their money. Yeah, they just bought $175 billion worth of a PSLV, which is the Sprott Silver Trust, which I find ironic because they, I don't know if they are still the custodian along with JP Morgan or they relinquished that of SLV, mm. uh, the world's largest silver trust. But here they bought $175 billion worth of uh, PSLV, excuse me, $175 million worth, pardon me. Uh, worth of, mm -hmm. of PSLV, which is a massive position and it makes them one of the largest shareholders in the account. And you're right, it would be a huge step. Um, you know, the the they're going to roll it out and say it would be a, a big thing for Bitcoin where if the ETF was approved so that retail investors could, you know, buy Bitcoin as shares of an ETF through an ordinary brokerage account. That's what they're going to come and say. Uh, what does it mean to their ability to manipulate things in the markets? Uh, wouldn't surprise me one bit to see it have a, a very significant impact. I don't know if it's if if it's a pro or a con, but mm -hmm. I know I, I I read a very interesting thing about Larry Fink, their CEO. He's going around mm -hmm. sending letters to all the CEOs <clears throat> of the companies that BlackRock invests in, saying if they're not ESG compliant, they're doing so yep. at their own peril. In other words, he's going to dump their shares. He's turning these companies, instead of being focused on their shareholders, being focused on woke ideology um, that really is not beneficial to the bottom line of these businesses. It, it is a evil enterprise that's got an $11 trillion balance sheet. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. people talk about George Soros and his his uh, role on on uh, on destabilizing this country. His fund is about one one hundredth. I don't know. It's a tiny speck uh, in terms of the size of influence, scope of influence that BlackRock has. And yeah, you're right. I think it's it's certainly here again, something very, very uh, important to keep an eye on. And and you're right. BlackRock is definitely involved in just about any everything. And they own so much of 
everything. And when you look at their role in real estate, as an example, in, in, in commercial and residential real estate, I mean, you'll see a company like BlackRock come in and scoop everything up at pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And maybe ultimately that's what they, they would do with Bitcoin. They would be involved in driving the price down to next to nothing and yes. scoop, scoop it all up and own it for themselves. I don't know if that's the case or not, but certainly, um, you know, having having a company that that is as involved as they are on a global level, you could argue they are <clears throat> they are as influential as anyone in the world on all of these markets and all of these companies. It's something that uh, uh, we should certainly keep an eye on, and and you know, it makes you wonder: is this of nefarious? Um, um, motivations or not. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to not think maybe it is a nefarious play where they will control the uh, massive amount of, of, of Bitcoin and drive the price down and scoop up the, the all of the, the, the coins at next to nothing and then run with it. I don't know. Again, all speculation. But anytime BlackRock is involved, you have to wonder, is this a good thing or not? And uh, a lot of people would say it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with the Bitcoin, with the Bitcoin situation, so I know Robert Kiyosaki. He is a great advocate for Bitcoin, and I respect his his ideology towards that and the way he sees it. However, though, this is my compelling argument. The goal is to have a central bank digital currency, more control for the banks, and more power for them. So, if Bitcoin still exists in the future. Well, even right now, they are a direct threat to right. the current system. So I don't see it succeeding and flourishing way down the road in the future. Temporarily, maybe it would hit 100,000, probably a little higher. But long term, that's a direct threat to the system. See that, I agree. And that's they what won't, I was saying. They won't allow it. They that's won't what I was it. saying about Christina Georgieva. You know, I, I don't think that she wants any competition with anything that they're it's doing. competition. Exactly. Right. That's right. I yeah, agree with so. Yeah, so they're going to find a way, whether it's through a uh, shutting down on and off ramps through taxes, banning it, or even just a cyber attack that was orchestrated to hit the, you know, the 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 mining areas. I mean, it could be anything, but they they will have a way to shut it down or at least get people out of it when the time comes. Because like you said, it's a competitor and they won't tolerate it. That's not in their plan. It's not part of their agenda. I um, agree. Anyway. And it's decentralization instead of centralization. And this yeah. is not what they want. Exactly. I agree. I have felt that for a very long time. I try to be much more political or uh, that's not even the right word. I just try to be, you know, um, look at this more with an open mind as it pertains sure. to cryptocurrencies, because it's not really my my area of expertise, I understand you You guys know a lot more about it than I do, but I, I do respect the power that these institutions wield. And I, I say it from a standpoint of, of concern, you know, it, they wield an awful lot of influence and power. And if indeed they are trying to roll out a system uh, of, of central bank digital currencies, they do not want competition in that space that will derail what they're trying to do. So I do agree with that on a broad sense. And stance. this is why gold, silver, precious metals are the best tangible asset you can own. And obviously yep. that's your expertise right there. So you can tell us more yes. about yeah, that. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's no question about it. And I think no question. one of the things that, that really people need to understand is that even though the price of gold and silver has not behaved the way we might think it ought to behave, the physical stockpiles across the globe are, are literally, literally disappearing uh, to levels that, that we've never seen before. I mean, I'll give you, give you an idea. Like, for example, right now on COMEX, the, the registered category right now is 27 million ounces in the registered category. Those are the bars uh, that back the, the all the contracts that out there uh, that are out there the the paper. open interest on those mm -hmm. contracts right now is north of 150 million ounces you're talking seven times as many ounces as there are bars backing those contracts uh, it, it's a it's a system where we're at the second lowest level in the history of the comex market where so many ounces have been bled down off the the 
registered category. And even the eligible category is down to 271 million ounces of which half of it is owned by SLV, supposedly a JP Morgan. Uh, you're talking the lowest levels ever when you have 270 million ounces completely and totally in the whole Comex ecosystem, India imported 304 million ounces last year. Exchange for physical, meaning exchange contracts off COMEX into the London Metals Exchange over the last few months have been north of 230 million ounces. We're getting to the point where we are running out of the ability to suppress the price because the biggest exchanges in the world are being bled dry by the biggest institutions in the world. For example, China, seven months in a row has been accumulating gold, they, seven months in a row. India, their numbers are, yeah. are up 40% over the last few years as they continue to add gold and silver to, to their, their coffers. The Central Bank of Iraq just added two and a half tons last month. Uh, Singapore's numbers are up 35% over the last three months. They're the biggest buyer of gold this year in 2023. The first quarter of 2023 saw 228 tons of gold purchased by the central banks. That's the mm -hmm. most ever in a quarter, which followed up a year where it was a record, where 1,136 tons were purchased. You put the last year and the first quarter together, it is the most gold that central banks have ever, ever, ever bought ever over an 18 month period of time. And so you are beginning to see massive amounts of gold and silver be accumulated by the biggest money in the world. And this is something that betrays the price. In other words, the big money is using the suppression of, of the Western markets, gold and silver prices on COMEX to drain the exchanges, not only of the COMEX, but of the LBMA. We saw the biggest one day withdrawal of silver in the history of the Shanghai Gold Exchange two weeks ago. So the big money is using this environment and this price suppression mm -hmm. uh, to reposition and, yep. and you know, get ahead of the game before people wake up. And here again, our media does a woeful job of telling us exactly what's happening. You have to dig and dig and dig and listen to a guy like me to figure this out. But I will tell you, it's, it's never been, um, I think, more concerning when you look at the level of supplies at the very, very top and how much has been bled dry. It speaks to me of the most sophisticated people in the world front running what is an eventuality, inevitability uh, of there being some sort of a, a squeeze on physical metals and the biggest money in the world will have already pulled them off of the exchange. And I just say it this way, when you pull your metal off of the exchange, when we see, for example, in, in one week, uh, you know, um, millions of ounces taken off the COMEX, it, it's gone. It's never coming back. It loses its industrial liquidity. So if, if an industrial player like Tesla, Elon Musk says, I'll pay a big premium for every silver bar people will sell me. Well, once they leave the ecosystem of COMEX, to get them back in there would have to be a huge task of, of, of reassaying and shipping them into the system, reintroducing them, assaying them at a big cost and time lag where you would never do that. So when these things are, are happening where the LBMA and the COMEX and the, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange are being bled dry, these are one-way tickets and this stuff's never ever coming back. And I think yep. that really portrays much higher prices in the end and the big money is using this environment to reposition without without any attention being drawn to exactly what they're doing. Ultimately, it speaks to much higher prices in the metals market. Absolutely. Right. I agree with you, Andy. And um, uh, I like to say that it's extremely important to own gold and silver, precious metals, along with digital assets. Now, the thing is, digital assets is more for creating wealth or generating you know, gains, profit down the road. Precious metals will protect your wealth and it's tied and true reliability of gold, you know, a trusted store of value for centuries that will preserve your wealth. So I believe in every sophisticated investor's portfolio, they should have both. You know, I what agree. I'm I agree. So, because they have their purpose. They serve they a do. different purpose. You know? They do. And I think you could see a combination of both 
take center stage in August. Uh, Jim Rickards has come out and publicly said, and I've been talking about the BRICS for three years before anyone did, and now everyone is doing it. You were ahead of your time, definitely. I was, and I'm proud to do it, and I think a lot of people have forgot about that because now everyone's talking about it. But Jim Rickards, who I respect a lot, he he uh, has spent time at the CIA. He, he ran simulated financial war games for them. He's very connected. Definitely. He came out and said that BRICS is going to issue or introduce their new gold-backed currency mm -hmm. at the August summit. Uh, this is a big deal. And mm -hmm. think about why have all the central banks been buying gold? Why did they all repatriate their gold? Why did the BIS reclassify it tier one? And Zero risk. That's right. And so all of the central banks who have been accumulating gold um, and have joined the BRICS union of Macron from France, just openly applied, asked for invitation to this meeting, our, our allies like Mexico, who have formally applied to BRICS. Now, France, who wants an invitation to the new meeting, um, rumor is Japan, who, you know, who, who just bought Russian oil above the West benchmark, you know, spurring the West uh, and their sanctions. Uh, uh, rumor is that, you know, well, France, who bought uh, liquid natural gas with Yuan and struck a 51-point agreement with China from 5G to military engagement. Rumors are Australia and New Zealand are considering joining BRICS. This is a situation where this BRICS phenomena is growing rapidly. And he came out and publicly said that they will issue a commodity-backed, most likely gold-backed currency uh, in their August meeting. We've been told this by the BRICS folks for over a year now, that mm -hmm. they would introduce a commodity-backed currency. Uh, and if this is when they are going to do it, a central bank digital gold-backed, commodity-backed currency, um, mm -hmm. this is going to shine a light on both of the things we're talking about here. And these are the types of things that very quickly, the things that we're talking about, which are somewhat... Um, um, you have to kind of use your mind's eye. They're not concrete yet. We follow the yes. crumbs. All of a sudden they become real and that's when things change overnight. So yeah, I, any way you look at it, the things that you're talking about here are becoming a reality and maybe even sooner than most people think. Yeah, that, yeah, that was my last video. We covered the how the US is downplaying uh, this narrative of the dollar losing its status. People keep saying, no, that's not going to happen. The dollar will still be around, sure. But if, if, like you said in your, the first time I heard you, you were saying that the world would start dumping dollars. Operation Sandman, I believe. Right. See, right. Operation Sandman, if that starts to take place, just because the world starts dumping the dollar, doesn't mean the dollar is going to crash. It just means we're going to see soaring inflation here. Correct. And, and that's a lot of people exactly are mixing right. the but, two up. But the byproduct of soaring inflation is where the catastrophe is because you can't have 25% inflation because everyone in the world who's owned dollars and had to own dollars since 1974 as a condition of the agreement with Saudi Arabia, hey, we'll, you know, you'll we'll protect, protect us you. and, and, and the Saudi kingdom and we will denominate through OPEC oil globally in US dollars. So everyone on the planet's owned dollars for 50 years. And if they no longer need to, they dump dollars, that creates the inflation. But the byproduct is of spiking interest rates. You can't have 25% inflation and 5% interest rates or your currency becomes worthless. So when interest rates rise, not controlled by the Fed, but by the market to compensate for the hyperinflationary dumping of dollars, then everything that is inversely related to rising interest rates, namely stocks, bonds, and real estate collapse. And here is your great reset. And here yeah. is what I really am getting at is that this is this intended because why would it be intended? Well, we have nearly 200 trillion in debt we can never pay off. And instead we now have a villain. It's Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC and all of these bastards that did it to us. And it, what becomes really interesting is you look at the top two advisors to the Biden White House. One is Lael Brainerd. She was at the Fed. She was at the Treasury. She's a modern monetary theorist that wants to get rid of all the banks and go directly to the public, well, the central bank with the digital currency. Well, look at what's happening to the banks. Look at how the Federal Reserve continues to leave rates where they are, allowing this mass exodus out of the banks into treasuries. Uh, and and talking about the fact that, or even the fact that they, the Fed has allowed 
the money markets to invest in the overnight reverse repo market, which has allowed the money markets to provide daily liquidity at 5% guaranteed by the Fed. That's greater than you get in any CD in a regional bank that Janet Yellen said won't be bailed out when they go under this time. So you have a fuse lit under the banks and look at who is orchestrating this, Lael Brainerd, but the bigger one would be Jared Bernstein, who was just appointed head economic advisor to the Biden administration. Jared Bernstein's main thesis is, is losing the world reserve status. He wrote a report in 2014 called King Dollar No More. It was picked up in, in the New York Times. You can Google it, pop right up. This is a guy who advocates for no longer maintaining world reserve because of the distortions it creates and the trade imbalances. Well, look at what we've done by weaponizing the dollar. You can say that's exactly the path we are heading down. We are antagonizing Saudi Arabia and we are weaponizing the dollar. The rest of the world is looking yep. for alternatives. You could not draw it up any better. One guy wants to get rid of the world reserve and the other wants to get rid of all the banks and go digital currency. Could it be this is a, a planned path that we are doing what we are doing to to finally get to a point where we can consolidate all the banks we can roll out a cbdc and we ultimately lose the world reserve status why yeah. because our debt burden is so big that we can never find our way out of it so if you find a villain instead who ruined the american way of life rather than it being the brain dead monetary policy of the federal reserve and 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 the fiscal policy of, of a government who have created more money in four years than in the history of the country before it, while maintaining 0% interest rates, creating distortions that have to work themselves out. And when they do, it blows up the system. Well, now there's your villain. So I, I, I get, you know, everything that is happening, you have to ask yourself, is it done coincidentally or is there a bigger agenda here? And I am right. beginning to believe that this is all being done purposely. They know where, where we are heading and look at the people advising the president. Get rid of the yeah. world reserve, get rid of the banks, go directly to the modern monetary theory and central bank digital currency. Now, if if you see rates continue to rise and more of these regional banks mm -hmm. fail and several yes. fail at once, bang, the fear that you will see in 45 days when, when Silicon Valley Bank and, and Signature Bank failed, we added 14,000 new clients in 45 days. I have never seen anything like it. Well, wow. literally, yeah. now it's kind of shut off since then. It's calmed down a lot. But the level of fear that I saw when those banks failed, the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in the history of this country, I've never seen anything like it. And quite frankly, I believe we ain't seen nothing yet. This is kind of the eye of the hurricane mm -hmm. where we've gone through the front edge and the trailing edge ain't hit us yet. Um, and, and I wonder by the people advising our administration, is this exactly what is intended and what does the second half of the year have in store for us? So, uh, you know, I wish I were more optimistic, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are scary times ahead. Well, well I Mandel, Mandel, real ahead. quick, I wanted to clarify this also. This is why going back to owning precious metals in a world that is so increasingly driven now by this digital currency narrative with central bank digital currencies and intangible assets, the ownership of precious metals is a very compelling choice. It really is. Yeah, so, no, I, I think it's, and I, and I want people to understand that to me, I don't look at it as an investment. To me, it's wealth. Mm -hmm. It's, it's wealth, wealth that's lived mm -hmm. through two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic, everything the world's ever thrown at it. And this will be no different when you realize that the most sophisticated money in the world is has literally drained the exchanges of the majority of all the stockpiles of gold and silver. And, and, and you know, so they're front running because they know the playbook. They know what's coming. And that exactly. is why, even though it's frustrating to see the price behave the way that it has, mm -hmm. I see a bigger picture. And the same way that you guys are able to see a bigger picture with XRP and Ripple, you see a bigger picture that others may not notice on the surface. And I think that's what your job is to do, is to help people understand what that bigger picture is. This is what my job is. And I'll simply say this, that as it pertains to metals, the price is being betrayed by the exodus and the accumulation by the most sophisticated money in the world. If price was completely indicative of value, then who's draining the exchanges? Why are the central right. banks on a buying spree of um, of, of literally unparalleled um, uh, comparison? And 
you know, you have to ask yourself, is this bigger than what the price would indicate? And, and that's why I talk a lot about misdirection, about suppression and misdirection, because it's not as straightforward as your eyes would lead you to believe that you have to trust your gut. And uh, I think this is one of those. And the same thing would be true with um, XRP and Ripley. You got to trust your gut. Yeah, your eyes show you things, but your gut tells you that this is bigger than what we are being led to believe. And you see right. reasons to, to talk about that. I think there's a lot of similarities in the way we look at the world. And definitely, um, you know, I admire that, that you guys <clears throat> stand up for what you believe in and what you, what you think is, is the case. Uh, and that's why I'm proud to, to come on well, and have an association with you guys. Cause even though I don't understand XRP and ripple the way you do, you make it easy to understand that it's something that people need to, to have exposure to. And, and for that, I, I respect that you show it the right way and people um, can then take from what you give them and, and, and make their own decision. I hope they're doing the same thing here with, with metals. This is um, to me a once in a generation um, mm -hmm. happening. This is once in a, in a lifetime generation, maybe even greater once in a hundred years type of event that, We're, you know, you got to get on the right side of it. Yeah, we're living through history right now, Andy. And um, the, the same concept, how you applies for gold and digital assets, you know, the price manipulation, price is a distraction. So for example, you know, market cap is irrelevant for digital assets with real use case. And I'll tell you why, because like Amazon in the 90s, the true value emerged after utility and adoption took place. And then the market cap didn't really predict Amazon's success, you know? Well, it's funny it, you say that because the value you comes after. And then when you research the XRP, price. you know, and again, because of you guys and because of Mel Carmine, who I've done some stuff with, I try and, and learn more about it. But just on the cursory, cursory research, the first thing that you'll see pop up against XRP and its high prices is people talking about market cap, that the market cap would have to be way up here for it to be at this price. And it's yeah, interesting sure. that you say that. So, you know, you're always fighting against forces that will try to push back. Um, and, and I respect here again what you just said. This is to me the one thing that I notice more than anything in talking about higher prices is immediately talking about market cap. And to your point, well, I think these are the things that that people need to understand. And, and that's why you're so valuable in bringing this information to your listeners. Yeah. Now, can I ask you one more thing, uh, Andy? I know we're getting close to the time to wrap it up, but... I want to get we want to get your take on the banks right now. So this is really a serious issue. The banking crisis is going on. You got all these little banks announcing shutdowns and some of them going out of business, filing bankruptcy. We do know it's a consolidation to move us towards the bigger banks that have more power. What what are your thoughts here? What's going on with the banks? Yeah, no, I completely and again, that's why I brought Lil Brainerd. I mean, her whole idea is getting rid of the banks. Good point. The Fed is aiding and abetting this by by keeping interest rates where they are, by allowing the money markets to invest in the overnight reverse repo market, by, you know, when when the banks failed, when the banks failed in 08, they made bailouts illegal and they made yes. bail-ins the law, meaning you are an unsecured general creditor that the, the public won't bail out the banks. And when the banks were bailed out here a few months ago, uh, the representative from Oklahoma in the, uh, in the um, uh, House subcommittee inquiry said to Janet Yellen, you know, Madam Secretary, you just bailed out um, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, and we were under the impression that was illegal. Well, she said the, the taxpayers won't be on the hook for that. Well, <clears throat> they will be through inflation, but that's irrelevant. <clears throat> he said, okay, so, but, so let me get this straight. So, you know, if, if a bank fails in Oklahoma here, uh, are, will my constituents be made whole? And she said, probably not. No. Yeah, what you're right. You mean, she she said. Well, you know, it would take an uber majority vote of the FOMC, which is the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, myself, and the president, in order for that to happen. So, first and foremost, she lit a fuse under the banks. The banks are now, you know, anyone who's got their money in a regional bank has to think to themselves, well, geez, you know, the banks are loaded with toxic assets. They have nothing in the way of reserves because during COVID, all reserve requirements were relinquished to zero. Yes. And when you deposit money into a bank, it is a liability to the bank, an asset to you. They have to offset that liability with an asset. 
So they would buy U.S. Treasuries earning 2% or mortgage-backed securities earning 3, 3 and a half. Those have all been cut in half in value roughly or more, 60% by the rapid increase in rates. So when you see all of these people request redemptions and they have no reserves, they have to sell assets that have been eviscerated in value, in essence, are toxic now, which puts them out of business. And that's why you see close to $100 billion right now in this new uh, emergency program that the Fed has. That's $100 billion at onerous rates with 100% collateral posted that these banks have to post in order for them not to be out of business. It goes to show the fragility of the system, but this is what they want. If they didn't want this, all they would have to do is say to the banks that the overnight reverse repo market is no longer allowed. In fact, if money markets have to sell all their interest in the overnight reverse repo market, they can't invest in it. They could do some things to prohibit the exodus out of the banks, but the fact that they have rates where they are much higher than the banks can compete with, this is why you're seeing so much money leave, not just the regional banks, but even the commercial banks. The big money are leaving the commercial banks in massive, massive amounts and going directly into yield backed by the treasury market, going directly to the to the Fed and staying away from the, the systemic nature, the systemic risks of the banks. And I really do believe this fits hand in glove with what Lael Brainerd wants. Get rid of the banks. And if you're going to issue a CBDC, it's much easier to do it through three or four commercial banks than it is through right. 5,000 regional banks. And how do you get rid of the regional sure. banks? Scare the shit out of everyone saying if they fail, you're out of luck. You are going to be bailed in an unsecured general creditor. Instead, go to a too big to fail bank like uh, Morgan Stanley or, or JP Morgan. Bank of America. Bank of America, buy their money market fund, which you can get 5%, which is investing overnight in the reverse repo market, backed by the Fed with daily liquidity, or stay in a regional bank, which will fail. And by the way, the best you can get is 4.5% in a one-year CD. And did I mention that those same regional banks control 70% of all the small business loans in this country and close to the same amount of all of the commercial real estate leases and loans and the small business is getting clubbed and, and the rising rates make it harder to meet demands. And so it more and more and more strain on the banks, the commercial real estate, when all these loans have to uh, be uh, um, uh, re-upped as these, these rates, a lot of them are on, on arms. And they, they, in fact, this next year, a large portion of them come up for, for uh, to, to be reset. Um, you can't pay 7% or 8% now when you, you're getting it at three. Uh, now you have to pay seven. They're going to go out of business. And who's going to eat that? The, the regional banks. Bang. They start to snowball, go out of business. People are bailed in. The panic that will ensue will be tremendous. Well, that's put a big smile on Lael Brainerd's face because she wants all of the banks gone. Why? It has nothing to do less to do with the loss of privacy that people talk about they know everything we're doing and more to do with monetary policy when money is created by the fed all they're able to do is buy bonds directly from the banks or or a mortgage-backed securities from fannie or freddie they can't buy things in the real economy and when the banks receive the money from the fed and they're obliged to sell them those bonds if they come calling the banks either have to lend it out into existence, and that's how money is created, either through a yes. credit card, a home equity mm -hmm. loan, a mortgage, a car payment, you name it. If they don't lend it, money is not created. Then if they don't lend it, they can't keep it. They got to give it back to the Fed in a reserve account in their name held earning 5% with safety. So the banks are saying, shit, I'm not going to lend it to you two brothers to start a company. When I can give it to the Fed at 5% with no risk, even though you guys got a convincing business plan, screw it. The economy is too screwy. Well, that's not what Lael Brainerd mm -hmm. and, the, and the Fed wants to hear. The Fed says if we want inflation and we buy the bonds and, and liquefy the banks, they should be lending it out there. But if the banks say, screw it, the economy is too scary. Yeah. Now you actually are deflating the economy, pulling liquidity out of the system by buying the bonds and not seeing a correspondent uh, uh, increase in, in, in lending. So 
Anyways, it's more to do with monetary policy than anything else. And so she wants to get rid of the banks. The first step would be to blow up the regional banks, force everyone into the commercial banks. Look at the top three commercial banks in terms of derivative positions. Goldman, City, JP, $150 trillion combined. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. The numbers are so big. If one of those banks goes, boom, it all blows up like mm -hmm. that. Everything yep. you, blows up. But do you think no a... Fear. Lil Brainerd is here with the central bank digital currency. Sign on the dotted line. You'll be made whole immediately. So to it's your point, yes, the banks the, are dead and it's going to happen and it's going to start to accelerate. People have forgotten because it all blew over. You wait for the third and fourth quarter when these... Yep. When these leases start to come up and and it, the strain on the commercial bank on the regional banks will be i think catastrophic and lots of pressure craziness yeah and it's a perfect plan yeah. to get people to accept a solution which would be the central bank digital currencies it's the perfect plan um in addition i want to ask you this do you think a spiral in interest rates could lead to that financial collapse 100 percent I, yeah. I've said that all along, but it will be one. Look, when they came out and said it was Putin's inflation, I knew they were looking for a villain. Oh, what bullshit because that was. Because if you studied economics, <laughs> uh, Austrian economics for 30 seconds, you would know in every example that uh, inflation is a monetary event. It's an increase in the money supply. Definitely. Yeah, the distortions created through the supply chain problems exacerbated price inflation, but inflation was created through creation of money and made yes. it much worse by distortions of interest rates, which distorted asset prices. But if if in that Saudi Arabian moment that I talked about where OPEC says, hey, you guys, listen, you've told us you're going green. That's cool. You want to go green, but we're partnering. We just signed up with not only BRICS and the Belt Road Initiative, 152 countries on the Belt Road and, and BRICS and, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is 60% of the Eurasian landmass. It's it's 50 plus percent of human population, yeah. the largest regional military and financial organization in the world. They just joined the BRICS New Development Bank. Everything is being put into place, including all the OPEC countries on the Belt Road for them to say, hey, Listen, it's cool. You guys want to go green. You've made that abundantly clear. So we're going to partner with the rest of the world that isn't, that happens to represent close to 80% of human population and has the military might combined much greater than ours when you put two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world in Russia and China in this group. So you get to a point where they say, you know, we're just not solely going to take dollars anymore for the purchase of oil. And bang, like that, every country dumps right. dollars because they don't need to hold them anymore. And they the snowball effect of everyone dumping dollars will create a panic selling event. What happens when those dollars hit our shore? Yes, it's hyperinflationary. But if you have 25% inflation and 5% interest rates, you might yeah. as well use your dollar bills as toilet paper. They yes. become worthless overnight. So interest rates have to compensate for that inflation. And if this is done by design, Think of Jared Bernstein, relinquish the world reserve standard. He is the lead economic advisor for this administration. If that happens, you now have a villain. Those sons of bitches, they blew up the American way of life. It was Xi Jinping, it was OPEC, it was Putin. How could they do this to us? It wasn't us, just because we created more money over the last four years than in the history of the country combined and kept interest rates at zero, creating distortions of epidemic proportions. It wasn't mm -hmm. that. It was them who did it to us. They're the bad guys. Think of how stupid people are in this country. The most of yeah. what they believe, as we've talked about earlier, is controlled by a narrative that's completely off base. Everyone right. will believe this is the case, and it will be it put. It will ignore the fact that a handful of of bankers destroyed everything in this country. Mm -hmm. They will. The history books will say it was. It was a global change orchestrated by Putin and Xi Jinping and, and the rest of the world. And we'll ignore the fact that it was the Federal Reserve and their brain dead monetary policy that really is the root of this. So, yes, I think yeah. that is their Klaus Schwab moment. It is <clears throat> their spiked interest rates to the moon moment. Not You can see the Federal Reserve doesn't want to raise rates much higher than five and a half percent. You can see what happens when they do. Put interest rates at 18 or 20%. What do you think happens to this entire system? Now you yeah. come in and issue your new CBDC backed by gold and, and oh, and Christina Georgieva and all of these things that we're talking about suddenly come into focus. And now 
you have your Nasara Jasara moment that was done by them and everyone's debt is forgiven on a global scale and to a degree. Yeah. Now you have to talk about here domestically, you know, someone's debt is someone else's asset. So I don't know how much that plays out, but on a macro massive global scale, yeah, I could see it happening mm -hmm. very, very, very much so where, look, they realize there's no way out of the pickle they find themselves in. And, you know, they talk about a $32 trillion debt that ignores Social Security, 77 trillion, Medicare, Medicaid, and government military pensions in total exceed $150 trillion. You we're mm -hmm. close to $200 trillion in debt. How do you pay it off? You don't. So what way do you get out of it? You default or you inflate. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't inflate your way out of 200 trillion without really creating a problem. But if you default, you're dead. Well, okay, let's default, but find a villain that created yep. the default. And that is the Someone law blame of, it on. of the world reserve standard. Right. It's right into Jared Bernstein's plan. Well, so what do you, this, um, I, honestly, real quick, I, I think, you know, a lot of solutions. the mainstream, the mainstream news that they, they keep sugarcoating the inevitable. And that really is that the economy is true. The American economy, in my opinion, is already dead. I think the only life support it has is credit, and that's going to dry up soon because liquidity markets are drying up. And this is happening at an alarming rate. So this really ties us back to the, the point of the challenge to the dollar's dominance. And then again, the fragility over the global financial system. But you're right. This raises the concern that a few sinister people are pushing for this narrative for all of this to unfold. So um, our best interests are not, you know, they, they don't have us in their best interests, the people. No, and the crazy, the, the part that's the worst about this, you guys, you know, you guys are both, uh, don't take this the wrong way, okay? You guys are both <laughs> handsome, um, articulate, uh, very- um, You are too, Andy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what I'm getting at is that you guys come across as being well-read, articulate, um, you take care of yourselves. You 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 just you seem very credible, right? And yet we come across to the mainstream as being tinfoil hat wearing conspiratorialists. But I'll say this: there were many conferences that I spoke at um, where I talked about gold manipulation and J.P. Morgan's role in it for years. Doug Casey got up and more or less lambasted me after I spoke, saying that would never happen. JP Morgan traders could never keep their mouth shut long enough for this to be true. And yet they just paid a $920 million lawsuit, a fine by the Justice Department for suppressing the metals market. It was real. There is a line between conspiracy and reality, and Definitely. it's hard to tread it. I admire you guys for doing what you're doing. Stick with it. You're Thank doing you, the world uh, a service. And it's sad that we have to talk about this most people would say, yes, sinister people controlling the world bullshit. It's true. And it's it true. And uh, and if if you don't wake up and open your eyes, you will never see what's coming. You can't get out of the way of it. And so, yes, I agree with everything you've said. And and I think there are a couple of sinister people and they're doing it. I think because we've milked so much out of this system that there is no way back. You can't produce our way out of this problem. So instead you default, you start over, you issue a new system, a new system that would be a digital based system and it would gain acceptance because people would be hurting so badly. When Klaus Schwab says you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, well, have no fear. We're gonna take care of everything you lost, but just sign on the dotted line, accept the new digital currency and all of your losses will now be in your new digital mm -hmm. wallet on your iPhone. Could that happen? Hell yeah. Why not? Yeah. And then look at the people that are advising this administration and say, wow, that's scary. That's exactly what they want to happen. So it is. Is it true? Is it conspiracy? I don't know. No. I'll leave that up to everyone out there to decide. Well, themselves. last words, Andy. Um, what last words do you have for people to protect their money? Okay. Their hard earned money. Because right <laughs> now, you know, on a, it's on a, a serious basic situation. Level, on a basic level, I get out of all variable rate debt as fast as you can, because even if there is some sort of Nasara, Jasara, and I don't know that there will be on, on a micro level, maybe on a, on a macro level, there will be, but get out of that debt um, and pay yourself first every time you can. If that means 
you know, if you got a thousand dollars every month to spend, you know, buy some gold, buy some silver, buy some XRP, buy some whatever it is that you Assets. think you're going to need to protect yourself. Buy some food, buy some water, get out of debt, have some supplies, be prepared and hope to God you never need to use that preparation to protect you. And if you're if you don't, so be it. You have food and water you can donate to a food shelf. You have gold and silver you can pass on to your children. You have a, a cutting edge cryptocurrency that you bought because you understood what its possibilities are. And if you do these things with an open mind and an open eye and you do it on your own, it, it's much easier to be wrong. And when you're right and you've done these things to protect yourselves, even though people around you think you're crazy, I can tell you there have been many times when people told me I was crazy. I sold my house with my second child uh, my wife being nine months pregnant in the middle of winter in the state of Minnesota because they were building homes in our neighborhood uh, where when I bought it a year earlier, I could see for a mile, they're building houses all around us for two thirds the price. I said to my wife, we're leaving. Biggest fight I ever got. And everyone said, you're an idiot. Why would you sell? I put all my equity into silver at $9 an ounce, 240,000 in equity. Four and a half, five years later, turned it into a million dollars by sitting and waiting because my gut told me, do this. I rented for five years. I built my dream house. Everyone said I was an idiot. You have to trust your gut and it will not be easy. And, you know, Amen. I think what yeah. would I tell people? Get out of debt, <clears throat> buy assets. Assets feed you, liabilities eat you. And if it's two ounces of silver and, and, and you know, one XRP token, every month, whatever it is that you can prepare, get on a systematic plan and pay yourself first and get out of variable rate debt. Those would be the two things that I would do first and foremost. Yes. Well, Andy, you know, I also think you're so spot on on everything we touched on here, but yeah, it's important also to remind that for people, they need to speak up and not be afraid of asking questions and uh, just digging in in general, because I really think we owe it to our heroes who fought for all the justice and freedom that we have today. And we have to continue that legacy to ensure that their sacrifices just don't go in vain. And uh, so I completely crazy. agree with you. And I don't think people out there really understand what it is that you and us, us three do, you know, I mean, you know, we're out there and we're standing up in our own way in a very visible way. Um, and you know, there's a certain part of that that's frightening. Well, we're doing our part and I hope other people do their part too. And, um, I, I can tell you, I don't need to do this. I don't, I've been doing, I've owned this company for 33 years and we're close to 9 billion in sales. I do not need to do this, but I do this because I feel it's just what I need to be doing. You feel you and, need to uh, do. Well, I, we have an obligation. That's why I keep saying how much I respect you two guys. And, well, I and respect I re that as well you from know, you, Andy. Thanks. What goes around comes around. And, and if you do this in a, in a very polite, uh, non-threatening, articulate manner, the way that you guys do, then, hey, all we're doing is, is, is sharing information. And that's what we're supposed to do. And, and hopefully people take just a little bit from what we talk about and decide for themselves. And, so I yes. personally am thrilled to have a relationship with you guys. I would like to do this more often. We don't do this enough. Even yeah, if it's once a month, I'd even see you guys once a week and talk about things. I'll leave that up to you, but I think- We will do it. I think I'd we're getting to a point, the second half of this year leading up to the election is going to be insane. And yeah. I think there'll be a lot to talk about. And I couldn't think of two guys I'd rather share it with than you. I appreciate that, Andy. Same here, Andy. We're going to send you that IMF document here in a few minutes. All right. right. So you can read on that if you'd well, like. To. Um, Andy, again, thank you, brother. You got Good it, talking my friend. To you. All the best to you two guys. And if you're ever down Florida way, let me know. And if I'm ever down your way, I will let you know. And Likewise. Uh, let's, uh, let's pick up again real soon. I'll look forward to picking up where we left off, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Sounds good. All right, all right awesome. Andy. You have thank a good you. day, brother. Be well, we'll everybody. Talk to you later. Yep. Take care.